Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining me again this morning on Next on the T. I'm your host, Chris Mascaro, and today we've got a great show in store for you. I have two great guys that I've really enjoyed talking with uh, joining me as part of the show today. First up is going to be Eric Johnson. You'll recall that Eric is the director of instruction at a golf course that we'd all love to play and is currently at the top of my bucket list, Oakmont Country Club. Eric is also one of Golf Digest's top 100 instructors. We're going to get Eric's thoughts on the Ryder Cup so far, what we've seen, plus uh, get some more tips and help from him to help all of us be better players. And he's going to be along uh, with me here in just a few moments. Later in the show, I'll be joined once again by Callaway Golf Director of Marketing, Jason Finley. Callaway's got five staff players in the Ryder Cup, three on our side, two on the Euro. So I wonder how Jason feels when he sees the uh, two European players uh, getting out there. It's got to be, uh, got to have some com- conflicting emotions, I imagine. We'll talk about that. Plus, they've got some great new equipment coming out, like their new Big Bertha irons. Jason's going to be along to join me about 20 minutes from now. But before we get started, we want to kick off the show like we do every week by saluting the brave men and women serving in our military. Thank you for your daily sacrifices and all you do to keep the rest of us safe. We also want to thank those of you who served or have served in every branch of the military and public service. We truly appreciate what you do to uh, preserve our freedoms and our liberties. It's through your strength and your efforts that our way of life is even possible. We also want to thank everyone listening in on iHeartRadio as well as great radio stations across the Internet like Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, Player.fm, and Blog Talk Radio. I want to give a quick shout-out to our good friends Mike Novak, Ben Kerr, Mark Medeski, and the rest of the great staff over at LastWordOnSports.com. Check them out online and on Twitter. Their site is fantastic. It contains great content across every sport, and their staff of writers are wonderful. You're going to love going to their site every day for your sports news. If you haven't been there yet, check it out and then bookmark it. Again, LastWordOnSports.com. So if anyone is dragging you to the mall or to the grocery store, you're tired of the same old, same old on your commute, you can also download a couple of apps, Player.fm and Stitcher, and you can take our show with you everywhere you go. So let us give you something you know fun to focus on while you're out and about or on your commute. We'd love to be a part of your uh, daily routine. All right. Now back with me on the Kyvin, <clears throat> pardon me, Kyvin Foods guest line is Eric Johnson. Let me give you a little more detail about Eric's background. He was a four-year letterman from 1992 to 1995 at Mississippi State, where he earned his degree in professional golf management. He remains in the Bulldogs' top 20 for most rounds played. He has been the director of instruction at Oakmont Country Club since 2004. Golf Magazine has named him a top 100 teacher every year since 2011. He was also recognized as Golf Digest Top 40 Under 40 Teacher. He is a three-time Tri-State PGA Teacher of the Year. He is also a two-time Horton Smith Award winner for his contributions to education, <clears throat> and he is on the advisory staff for TaylorMade Adidas Golf. Played on the uh, Can- uh, Canadian Tour, the Sunshine Tour, and the Golden Bear Tour. And last time uh, he joined me, I could have talked to him all day long, which is why we wanted to get him back as quickly as we could. Good morning, Eric. Thanks for being back with me on the show. Hey, Chris. Thanks for having me again, buddy. Thank you so much. Eric, I, I, I'm curious. You know, we got the Ryder Cup going on. It's going on over my shoulder right now. What's been your impression from what you've seen so far? Well, you know, I mean, again, uh, it's uh, it's been a battle again. Um, I kind of predicted that uh, the Euros would take it by three, and uh, it's, uh, wow, it's real close. You know, it's funny, when, when you watch these Europeans, they just make putts. They, they finish it off. I saw that great stat. I don't know if you saw that, but... Of the last, you know, eight or ten years, of all the matches that went through to the 18th hole, the Euros had like 24 birdies to our 10, and they won the hole. Wow! And and you just see that, you just kind of see that happening. I mean, a heck of a comeback from, uh, you know, I mean, Sir, or uh, you know, Rory McIlroy and Poulter. I mean, it was right. Wow. I mean, how about Jimmy Walker and Ricky Fowler? I mean, they, they are they are awesome team. They're playing their butts off to get halves. I mean, it's awesome. Awesome to watch. Yeah, yeah, agreed. You know, and and two, you know, a, a pairing, Eric, that you know I've been sort of riveted to is you know the two rookies, Jordan Spieth and Patrick Reed. How exciting are those two guys? I mean, you know, and and Tom Watson for making the decision to put two rookies out there together. Um, those guys are a lot of fun to watch. They're incredible. I, I'm telling you, they're they're just mowing people down here. It's fun to watch. I mean, 
you know, how about the guts from Tom Watson to sit this horse? Uh, I mean, Phil Mickelson, a Ryder Cup hero, star, Hall of Famer, you're going to sit him and you're going to throw these two rookies out at these guys and then watch these two rookies perform beautifully. I mean, right? it's fun to watch. It's unbelievable. Yeah, you know, undefeated so far. Yeah, and, it, you know, at the end of the game, it sounds a little cliche, but, you know, the game of golf is winning. And I, You know, I mean, as I look back at the Ryder Cup, uh, you know, e- even now, I mean, you know, whether you can say Europeans or Americans, obviously, you know, I'm a diehard American fan, but we've been losing so much, I've kind of mellowed. But it's, uh, you know, I mean, the game of golf is, it's true, the game of golf is winning. And, you know, it sounds it sounds crazy, but it's great to see the guys out there. It's great to see them at the end of the match shake hands and, you know, say let's, uh, let's you know, get some lunch and, and hang out. But it, it is cool to see. I do miss, i got to tell you, I do miss, the little Seve confrontations everywhere. I miss a little bit of that. I think the Ryder Cup's missing a little bit of those uh, demons. But uh, Polder has been trying to, to trying yeah. to you know ca- you know carry that torch. But uh, no one could do it quite like Seve. I, he was he was one of my favorite players to watch. I mean, just hit it all over the place and got it up and down and made birdies and just just a just a, a imaginative person. I, the tour is missing those kind of guys right now. I really miss Seve. Miss watching him. Yeah, one one of the things we've talked to, you know, some of our previous guests about, Eric, is, you know, in, in, in not just on the Ryder Cup side, but just generally on tour, is, you know, the guys with big personalities, right? I talked to, you know, Paul Stankowski last week, and Paul talked about, you know, how he, you know, either likes to watch or play against guys with the big personalities. And, and whether that's, you know, you're, you're a fan or you just, it's a guy you love to hate. But, you know, we seem to be missing a little bit of that, you know, to your point out on tour. Why is that, do you think? What happened? Well, you know, heck, we live in this social media world where anything you say now gets bombarded out go. throughout the whole world. And and back in the days, I mean, they weren't playing for this kind of money. I think that, you know, I think these guys are saying, listen, if I can work for 10 years and make, you know, $5 million a year, I got $50 million, I'm checking out after this. And I think that they're... They're just grinding it out, you know. I mean, I just think there's so much money, you know. Anything that gets said is instantly posted around the world, and even if you say something stupid like this, Patrick Reed when he said, you know, I'm a top five player in the world, that gets out there immediately, and everyone says, oh, he says he's top five. I don't think he quite meant it. Maybe he did. I don't know, but maybe he didn't mean it quite the way it came out. Maybe he said, maybe I'm playing the way like a top five player in the world. Right. But, you know, but but you know, silly things like that come out, and and you know, I mean, you look at it over the career. I mean, and I'm not saying any of this is right either. I mean, when Fuzzy said his goofball comments, I think he was probably had a couple out there walking around on Augusta, and you know, and just kind of said some stupid stuff, and then and that stuff gets out, and it's not okay. But you know, I mean, we live in this world now where anything that you say is dissected under a microscope. You know, so. I think that the guys are being more careful. You know, you just don't see the the train wrecks like John Daly anymore. I mean, they just don't they just don't really exist out there. They can't. They can't exist. Right, because to your point, I mean, we're we're all the media now, right? I mean, everyone everyone with a smartphone, you know, is the media. Because exactly. You never know get when someone is 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 videotaping you, taking a picture of you, and you know everyone. You know, at least if you're you know a celebrity or a, you know a big time athlete, you've always got to be careful of what you say and where you say it because, to your point, five minutes later it's going to be on Twitter. Yeah, you know, and I mean, this is you know what I not to bring a parallel into this, but Ray, the Ray Rice deal. I mean, how many times in the NFL? Have we seen domestic ex- dis- disputes and DUIs and you know public drunkenness, all this crazy stuff? But now we have a video, and that's like the smoking gun out there where everybody's going to jump on this video and say how bad it is. Well, there's been hundreds of cases of that before, but now you actually have the physical viewing evidence, and now it's the worst crime that anybody's ever heard of. You know, I mean, right. it's a little. I, I trust me. I think that you know, he's a piece of garbage, you know, for, for doing that to his wife. But, you know, I mean, before, you know, it was like, okay, domestic dispute, okay, two games off. and But now we have the video showing how bad it is, and, and and you know, he deserves everything he's getting, I think. You know, I mean, that's probably pretty harsh to say, you know, a guy's going to lose five, seven million a year. But, uh, 
you know, he's got a video, and that's how that, I think that's the I think that's the parallel to what we're seeing on the tour, where you're not seeing these Lee Trevinos and the happy crazy guys anymore. I mean, you know, you look at the personalities back on the tour, back when they had guys like uh, Doug Sanders and Lee Trevino and all these crazy guys out there on tour. It was more of a fraternity, you know. I think, uh, and I think that's how they used to do it. I think they always had, you know, I, I had dinner with Doug Sanders, and I. I, I'll never forget it. He goes, yeah, back then the tour were the three Bs, booze, broads, and birdies. And I think that's <laughs> what they talked about. I mean, I think that's what the tour used to be, the three Bs for them. Now it's, I need to make $100 million and check out. You know, I mean, it's, it's so it's a different different world out there. Yeah, well, that's very true. Um, let's just get back on on, uh, on the course a little bit, Eric. I mean, I'm curious to, to get your thoughts, you know, at, um, and then you alluded to it a, a moment ago. You know, Phil Mickelson, who's the you know making a record tenth straight appearance, you know, in this year's Ryder Cup. Um, and you know, he seems he's played well when he's when he's had Keegan Bradley as as his partner. I think you know he he gets a little energy from the younger guys, Anthony Kim, a few years back. But, you know, after yesterday afternoon's loss, he tied Tiger Woods for the most Ryder Cup matches lost in history with seventeen. He's fifteen and seventeen overall. Tiger. You know, 13 and 17 overall, so that's nothing great to look at. So obviously, they're two of the greatest players of all time. But what do you attribute the fact that they don't dominate in this? Not only do they not dominate in this format, but they're not even 500. Yeah, you know what? It's a, it's an absolute puzzle. You know, I mean, you've got. I saw a stat on Furyk. Furyk has like 14 losses, 15 losses, something crazy like that. And you think of these grinders that these guys are, and you would think, and I think that, uh, I think that the what I, you know, and I think to Paul Stankowski's you know comment when you're playing someone who you feel is larger than life, you feel like there's deep down in you that there is something else that you have to you have to prove to yourself and the world, and and I think when these guys get in there and they start battling it out trying to show that they are going to take down one of the top players in the world, then then you know I mean it's that deep down in I, I it's so hard to describe but you know there's something in you that says you know what i want to take it to this guy i'm going to give it everything i got and you know i think that you know when you watch phil and and tiger especially with his dominance in the world of golf and the way he was growing up and in the the amateur world and winning all those matches i mean come on you tell me you can't even get 500 out there it's it's unbelievable but but furick's the same way i think he's got 14 or 15 losses it's it's unbelievable and you know i think that I think it's uh, kind of when you look back at like a Freddie Couples and you know and and Ray Floyd that that pairing that was such a dominant pairing and you look at you know I think I think Phil mentors these guys and I think that he helps them out out there and then they also are world beaters I mean Anthony Kim I you know I mean he was so good back in the days and then you know when he gets with Keegan and 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 Phil that's that's hard to beat but again you know we saw him sit out the whole day. I mean, right. your, your horse, your horse out for both matches. Unreal. Yeah, hard to believe they're not playing at all today. I was very surprised. I figured he'd play him in the afternoon. I thought he'd say, right. you know, sit, sit him out, okay, play 36, take the morning off, and we'll see you in the afternoon and get ready. And, right. you know, but he's driving, you know, Phil's driving a little wild and, you know, missing a couple short putts. And if you look at his Achilles heel, I think that, you know, through his career, I mean, there's God knows how many majors this guy would have won if he could have made some short putts. You know, you think Shinnecock Hills and you think of, uh, you know, uh, Wingfoot and you think all these great places where he should have won. But, man, his just speed was so off on those short putts that he didn't win. You know, I mean, man, he could have yeah. – he could literally have 12, 12 majors, I think, right now and probably should. Yeah. Right, and he's he he's our generation's Arnold Palmer, right? How many you know, how many you know how many majors did Arnold throw away from a a wayward drive or you know taking a to, you know taking a risk that he probably shouldn't have taken? I think Arnold would be the first to tell you that you know he he's done that. I think he said that many times. But Phil Phil's our our generation's version of that. Great, Absolutely, you know, great to root Absolutely. for. But yeah, no, and it is. I mean, you know, it was funny. I. With the last time I saw Mr. Palmer, he was telling the story about, yeah, you know, at Oakmont I had 13 three putts and Jack didn't have any, and man, I outball strike him. He's still talking about. It. It's 52 years later. He's still talking about. It. But he, he and he won't let it die. He won't let it go. Yeah, I just outball strike him. He just putted better. <laughs> right. 
He's a piece of work. So, Eric, you know, I, when when I do the research, you know, for, to prepare for you coming on the show, there's there's another good golfer named Eric Johnson who played on the tour for a while, played his collegiate golf at the University of Oregon. I got to imagine you, you you two have to be mistaken for one another all the time. Is 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 that the case? Well, you know, there yeah, he was out there pretty much the same time I was, and I'll never forget it. We were playing in Erie, Pennsylvania, at the Erie Classic. Erie Golf Charity Classic, big event, big, huge pro-am, uh, two-day deal uh, back in the day when the Grassies ran that tournament. And it was Eric Johnson, Eric Johnson, Doug Johnson, and Kerry Johnston. And we all played together. <laughs> and, you know, it was like, good shot, Johnson. Everyone turned around, thanks. You know I mean? Who, 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 are, who are you talking to? But I have met him. We played together, and uh, he's a good player, really good player, hit it a long ways. He spun it, the ball like, no one I've ever seen. I mean, he could, he hit down on it hard, and man, he put it high and spun the. Uh, you know, I couldn't believe how much spin he put on the golf ball. But he he was a good player back then too. I think he's still out in Oregon somewhere. I, I, right. I haven't seen I haven't seen him in a long time. But yeah, he was out there too when we were playing. Mm-hmm. I read an article in Arnold Palmer's magazine. Speaking of Mr. Palmer, his magazine's called Kingdom. That when you need to sink a putt, forget all the high dollar putters. You reach for a three dollar putter you bought in a thrift store. Is that true? <laughs> that is true. Yeah, you know, I mean, it was funny. I was donating some clothes in a Goodwill shop, and I, you know, I I call this putter the spirit of the dead man. I, you know, I mean, my my <laughs> friend Chris Rodell, who writes for these, uh, you know, the King Magazine, we were doing an interview, and we. I've been. It's been really cool to be in Mr. Palmer's magazine, and and uh, so we're doing this piece on putting, and and you know, Chris said, "What is this putter?" And I said, "Well, it's a funny story. I was donating these clothes, and this lady said, you know, can you take them to the back?'" And I went walking back there, and I, you know, I see all these golf clubs, and I said, "What are these?" And you can just imagine some golf widow, you know, these clubs. He played every Wednesday, Saturday, Sunday. I'm getting rid of these things, you know, after the man passes, and. There's all these McGregor, you know, woods and and this, you know, Spalding TPM two putter. In fact, it's it's literally in my hand as we're talking. And Is that right? It's in my hand right now. And he, uh, you know, so I walked back and I said to the lady, I said, "What, what are all these golf clubs? Said, they're all there for sale." I said, "Well, how much are they?" She goes, "Well, they're three dollars a piece." <laughs> I said, "I'll take them." She goes, w- "Which ones?" I said, "All of them. I'll take them all." So I went. I've got. You know, here I am trying to donate all this stuff and get rid of stuff, and I come home, and my wife said, what are you doing with all these clubs? I said, well, honey, you can't. There's, they're McGregor Woods. They're $3. Said, I don't care. We're trying to get rid of stuff. You're bringing stuff in. But I putted with this putter for so long. I mean, you know, first of all, it's got that little pencil shaft and that really thin, small shaft. It's got tremendous feel. And, you know, when you're playing Oakmont and the greens are rolling 13, 14, I don't need Ooh. something that puts more overspin on it. I mean, I need something that slows it down. I mean, that's right. what we're trying to do around here. I mean, short game, you're trying to make the ball not get away from you, not 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 increase the revolution, you know. And, you know, all the all the designers out there at TaylorMade think I'm crazy, but I say, hey, guys, I, you know, man, I play in the real world. You play in a laboratory, you know what I mean? <laughs> I play in the fastest laboratory around, you know what I mean? You, I, don't, I don't need it. I don't need it. I don't need it coming off faster. I need to slow down, especially when you get the yips like me. I'm forty, forty three now, and I'm you know, I'm, heck, my my days are behind me. But I'm starting to get a little yippy with a putter. I need it to slow down. I don't need it to speed up. But uh, <laughs> that's nice. my deal on that. So you, you you know, let's talk a little bit about Oakmont for for the the folks that didn't join us last time. Um, one one of the staples at Oakmont is, is is the church pew bunkers that come into play, you know, on Absolutely. three and four. And typically, yep. when we see pictures of guys who have gotten themselves in there, we can maybe we can see them from the waist up. When when players find themselves in there, what advice do you give them for the secret for getting out? Okay, you've you've hit it in trouble. Now get out. Just sandwich it back out and play. Take your medicine. Make a bogey. You know, try to hit something on the green. Maybe give yourself a chance at par. But, you know, we see it time and time again. People get in there, they're 170 yards out thinking they're going to clear this, these lips. And, you know, sure enough, they ding it to the side, and then they ding it to the side, and then they pitch it out and pick it up. You know, it's like, guys, just <laughs> take your medicine, get it out. You know, you, you, your biggest mistake was you're in there. Now get out. And, uh, you know, I mean, 
you know, it's so funny. When you see guys and you see match play events and things like that, if you're in trouble, get out. Give yourself a chance to make a par. Old man par is so crucial out there, and it's so often overlooked. I mean, if you think about how good par would be in most of your events, you know, just just get it back out. Get it back in play. That's the secret to match play. The secret to match play is trying not to make mistakes. You know, if you went around and you made a bunch of pars and you threw in a birdie every now and again and you didn't give that, that person back any momentum, you're going to win that match. And it's amazing how in match play, I think, you know, we were talking about this the last time. We have Oakmont versus the Loch Lomond Cup matches. And Loch Lomond's, a, you know, literally the Augusta of Scotland. And we go over there on the even years, and we were just over there. And the Europeans, they play all the time. They're playing their local clubs. They're playing other clubs. They're playing matches all the time. Here we play we play a lot of stroke play stuff. And, and you know, well, it's 75 today. You know, and over there they're playing in this crazy winds and, and crazy conditions, and they know how to grind it out. And I think that's why, if you look at the Ryder Cup, I think that's why they're a little bit stronger players. They grew up playing match play. They grew up playing in crazy, awful conditions, and they're a little bit tougher. You know, I mean, they're not afraid of the golf course doesn't look like Augusta. They, if it's blown and it's hard as a rock, they figure out how to play it. And I think that... To me, that's the biggest difference between the American players and the European players. They seem to be a little tougher. They seem to play a lot more uh, match play. They're used to wind and conditions. I mean, think about that European tour. They go all over God's creation playing that tour. Our guys, okay, we take three weeks in Florida when the weather's real nice, then we go out to California for four weeks, and then Hawaii for a couple weeks. And, you know, I mean, these guys have it pretty easy compared to those European tour guys. And those European tour guys are playing in some... Crazy, crazy weather. And uh, to me, that's why they're a little bit tougher players. But that also, you know, it raises in my mind, Eric, a, a, a kind of a mindset. As you say, that, you know, they grow up over there playing match play. You know, and uh, so in match play, you know, every hole is a clean slate, right? I mean, if, if you had a terrible hole and you just made a triple, right? Here, that's weighing on you because all of a sudden now I got I got to figure out I get I may have to go at it a little bit harder because I've got ground to make up. So it it, it sort of gets into your mind. It, it changes you know your strategy for the rest of the round and that sort of thing. In match play, well, I made a triple. So what? Or I picked up because I was out of the hole. All right, that was last hole. Now I get to start over. There's another exactly. whole another golf tournament right here on this hole. Exactly, and I think that's why some of these guys they can go out and make five or six birdies and they make a triple and. And 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 you know you know a double, they're the harder ones to beat in match play than that guy that's going to go out and you know make you know a bunch of pars and two birdies. I mean, they're the hardest ones to beat. You know, I mean, and when you get that going, I mean, again, these guys are so they're these Europeans. We go over there and play those guys, and they play to their handicap. I mean, they they play better than their handicap. Where here we almost have this overinflated idea that, you know, man, I'm a two when you're a seven. And, you know, we don't, we, oh, hey, my handicap says I can only take uh, a six, and I'm not even going to try to make these, you know, putts for a double. I mean, these guys are grinding their way out because they had to. Um, you right. know, and I, I think there's a big difference there. I think that, you know, we over here think, well, I'm a, I'm a two. Well, no, you're a ten, and you play <laughs> like it, you know. And, and so I, I, I just don't. I don't understand the delusional handicap. So those guys, they grow up over there, they play all that match play, and 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 they are tough people. Uh, they are tough people to play. They and they take it. I mean, you know, it's it's funny when we talk about these Loch Lomond Cup matches. Those guys over there, our guys go over and we're in Scotland. They're they're trying to drink them out of scotch for the week, and and that's really hard to do because they keep making it. And those guys come over here and they're like, I'm playing for my country, I'm playing for my town, I'm playing for, you know, my club. I mean, there is a spirit of uh, of almost patriotism over there that's it's incredible. It's fun to watch. I mean, those guys, they take it really – I mean, you know, I never – it's one of the funniest things of one of the first matches we were over there, and I've gone over there nine times now, and – and to play in Scotland, and I absolutely love it. I hopefully when I retire, I can go over there and uh, you know spend some time over there. But I've got so many kids, I'm not sure. I've got three kids, I'm not sure I'll ever retire. But uh, <laughs> I might be out here on yeah. the <clears> tee <throat> when I'm 80. But I don't know. But when we, I went over there and I putted it to about 12 inches, 
and the guy didn't give it to me. And I looked over and I said, Raymond, I said, did this somehow become a stroke play event? He goes, well, no, you you know, you got you got a foot. I said, Ray, my man, a foot? <laughs> <laughs> so finally I shamed him into giving it to me. I said, I didn't fly 4,000 miles to put a foot putt over here. This is supposed to be for, you know, camaraderie for the clubs. And he said, oh, yeah, oh, oh, okay, you know. I haven't missed a foot putt since I was 12. You know what I mean? Come on now, my man. But they take it seriously over there. They are really something. Really, really a lot of fun, though. Great people. There you go. A couple of weeks ago, um, our mutual friend, Bob Friend Jr., made his uh, second appearance with me on the show. Great guy, great guest. He he was actually uh, going to be heading your way over to uh, Oakmont uh, following our our interview. But I'm guessing you've teed it up over at his course over in Morgantown, West Virginia, Pinewood National Golf Club, which is, I've said to Bob since I've taken the, the tour, if you will, the video tour online. It looks like an unbelievable golf course. What's been your impression of that place? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, Bobby Friend is a—he's a good man. He's, uh, you know, and we were chatting briefly. I think, you know, that kid's tougher than a nickel steak. He is, uh, you know, and he has uh, his father was the, uh, you know, pitcher for the Pirates and had one of the right. lowest ERAs. And I mean, you know, World Series, you know, World Series champ, 1960. And you know, we were watching the Pirates and Root Sports is going crazy right now and with the Pirates win and they were showing the old classics and I played with Bob Friend Sr. the other day and you know my kids are you know sports fanatics and I said hey guys Mr. Friend's going to pitch up here and I think he was pitching to Roger Maris or somebody like that and you know you start thinking about these names that they played against in the 60s World Series it was unbelievable right. and uh, my kids are like can you get Mr. Mr. Friend's autograph I said absolutely and pitch is so nice he you know, sign some balls for my kids, and I mean, he's just a real, real, real gentleman, but it gets me back to Bobby, and, you know, Bobby, I think, grew up in that mindset that, you know, I don't think he had a lot of talent, but I just don't think you'd find anybody else out there that worked harder, and I've talked to Bobby about this. I said, I think you're the biggest overachiever the Tour's ever had. I mean, you you had good, you had talent, but you weren't, you weren't overly talented, but he worked harder, and he's got a bulletproof mindset. I mean, I really think if you asked him right now out of ten times that how many times down at Pikewood National do you think that you would beat Rory McIlroy, he'd probably say nine. I swear to God, he'd say, you know, by the tenth time right? he'd start getting to know the course. But I think I'd get him. <laughs> you know, I really think I'd get him for the first nine. And you go, wow, I don't know what planet you're living on, pal, but he's going to wax you every time, you know. But but he really thinks that. And, you know, it most of us are so fragile. You know, we get out there and miss a putt, and I think that goes back to your point of earlier. In match play, you know, it's like a you just got to flush it. You know, it's water off a duck's back. You know, it just has to roll off your, your back. You know, you can't even think about it. And I think that's how bulletproof-minded that guy is. But when you talk about Pikewood National, I'll tell you what, Bob Gwynn, their designer there, the, he was a one-hit wonder. He's a great man, takes a bunch of lessons from me over here. He's a member here as well. And he designed an absolute gem. And, you know, it doesn't fly up the world rankings like that. I think it was ranked 74th in the world. In the world! And it's, what, eight years old? You know, I mean, uh, it, 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 a, cor- a course like that just doesn't fly up those charts if it's not the real deal. And it is. It's hard. It's a long walk. It's, uh, you know, there's no carts, and they have two tee boxes. They have a like a member tee, championship tee. No, no late, no four tees, no senior tees, no anything. You, that's the course. Go play it if you want, you know. And 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 I'll tell you what, you get your, you got to get your hiking shoes on there. I mean, it, it was a really, really interesting story, fascinating story about how when Bob Gwynn was out walking, he said, you know, it's full of mountain laurel and it's in the mountains, and you can see on one, you can see on one tee box literally for 45 miles to this next wow. mountain range over on. It's stunning. And so he said, I was walking around down at the bottom of the property, and I could hear water. I could hear water. I said, I can't, I can't, I, I don't know where this is. It's not showing up on the topographical map. So he said, I called my maintenance guys. I said, cut me a line until I hear that water. So he's, they're chopping through all this mountain laurel, and they get there, and there's one of the most beautiful waterfalls, natural waterfalls you've ever seen. Not a Donald Trump, you know, 120-foot thing in Florida which doesn't yeah. fit, but a real, true waterfall. And it's the fifth hole, 
and they put this par three of the greens right in front of the par, you know, right in front, and the waterfalls in the background. It is stunning, and it's I believe it's worth every bit of that, you know, top 100 rating in the world. I, I think it was 44 in the U.S., but in the world it's 74 or something. Wow! But it's it's a special place if you. If you ever get a chance, you got to put that on your list. In fact, we got to get you up here. we got to get you to cross Oakmont and Pikewood off your list there. Chris. There you go. Now you're talking my language. Absolutely. So, Eric, um, before before we let you go, there's there are a couple things that I, I wanted to talk about from, from your website, ericjohnson.com. You, you've got so many great instructions on there. And last time we talked a little bit about your putting and chipping videos. So I want to go a little bit different direction. I found an article in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette uh, back in 2009. And you said a place that you like to start with new students is really to understand their weaknesses. So you, you talk about keeping stats on yourself, you know, fairways and regulations, greens and regulations, number plus those sorts of things. So talk about why that's important so you can really understand where your game needs to be developed. Well, you know, I mean, I think that, you know, when we, we walk off the golf course and you say, well, I had 78 today, and I ask these kids all the time. I mean, I'm blessed to teach a bunch of good young kids. And I say, well, okay, what did what'd you shoot? Well, I had 78. All right, well, what did you do wrong? Well, you know, um, hmm, um, um, well, uh, I missed a putt. Where? You know, I mean, they, 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 don't, they, don't, they, don't, they don't think about it that way. They just think of a number. And, you know, so, uh, it was, you know, every tour player I work with and, you know, I worked with uh, Per Ulrich Johansson and, you know, the first thing I did with Per is I went and said, uh, listen, I've got the shot link, guys, and I said, give me all his stats. You know, I want to know where he's good and where he's bad. And he was like 50th in ball striking and his chipping was 162. And I said, Per, you know, I mean, he wanted to work on full swing. I said, we're walking right over the short game area. We're going to chip. He goes, no, no, no. I, said, I, I chip because my – Long game is I hit it left. I said, "Pair, you only miss four ground, greens around. There, you know, I mean, you're going to miss something. You know, I mean, but when you do, you got to get it up and down. You know, I mean, and it was hard for him to, uh, you know, he wanted to go work on full swing, and which most people do, but <clears throat> a lot of times that isn't the case. You know, you might hit great and you know have 36 putts, and you know, so I'm not going to go. You shoot 77. There's a lot of different ways to shoot 77." Uh, in our section championship, I had 15 greens and I had 36 putts last, you know, uh, at at St. Clair. And you know, I mean, I walked off the course going, "Wait a minute, I hit it unbelievable, but I had 36 putts. If I putt like a normal human, I shoot 70." And uh, so I wasn't going to go out and and go hit balls. I went over to the putting green and tried to find out why I keep missing everything over there. But uh, you got to keep stats on what you're good at and what you're bad at. It's uh, really, really important. I also read where you talk about the importance <clears throat> of footwork and your toes, which seems odd to talk about your toes impacting your golf swing. Talk about our footwork and what it should be like. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, you know, one of my true mentors was Jim Flick, and I miss him every day. I uh, he was he was a man's man. He just he com- he just he just commanded respect out on the on the tee, and he was so much fun to work with, and he made it fun and. One of his biggest things that he taught me was the correct way that the feet roll. You know, I mean, we hear all this thing about posture and spine angle, but if you think about it, if you're standing there on the ground and you're shooting up off of your right foot, well, you've totally destroyed your posture. You're up and out of the shot. And, you know, to me, the greatest way to improve your game is to be able to hit the ball in the center of the face every single time. Once you learn how to hit it in the center of the face, which which the feet the feet they roll in they roll inward they roll the left rolls in a little bit and the right rolls in and at impact the right heel is still basically on the ground especially with an iron or anything on the ground and, but I see so many people that get to the top and they jump up off of their back foot so one of my all time go to best drills especially this works for not only if you're not hitting it solid but if you got that shank word that that guy. You know, if you got that yeah. that word, just stick your right toes, you know, your big toe up to the top of the shoe, hit a few shots, and think about it. If your body weight is going towards your toes, that hosel of the golf club is now working closer to the ball. Not a good thing. You cannot have that happen. 
So if it if it teaches you to keep the weight a little bit more over the center of your foot, you know, I mean, that is one of my all to go all time go to drills because it shows people how to stay in their posture. And that was something that I was lucky enough to spend a lot of time with Jim Flick, and uh, and every second was a, was a treat <laughs> to spend with him. He was it he was. was incredible. His stories were not only were his stories great, but you know, I mean, it was. It was it was awesome. We we were at the Taylor Made Invitational and we were sitting there with uh, one of my one of my uh, members and CEO here of a company in in Pittsburgh and and Jim was working with this guy and you know he he's a piece of work. He's a really good guy. So we're up there and he's got kind of a unique swing. <clears throat> so he said, "All right, coach. You know, here you go. This is what this is our product. You know, what can you do with this?" So he gets Alan in this great posture and he says, "So." Let me let me ask you. He said, Alan, what's that feel like? And and so Alan goes, Well, I don't know, Coach. What's it supposed to feel like? <laughs> and Flick went haywire. He said, Are you the CEO of your own company? And he goes, Yeah. And he goes, Well, you're not really good at following damn directions. Don't you ever <laughs> ask me a question to a question. And he hit him on the butt. And he said, Now how's that feel? And he goes. Feels great, coach. <laughs> but he had total re- he had total command over the tee. I mean, he was, and he didn't mean it bad. He was just he was just telling Alan, "Don't you ever answer a question with a question to me." And, and he just slapped him around. It was hilarious. And ever since then, I mean, he he had a way of just dealing with people. He was he was awesome. I miss That's him every great. day. Eric, what what events have you got coming up that our uh, listeners should know about? Well, we have uh, we have the men's open coming up in 2016. You know, preparations right. are already begun. We've cut some more trees down. We've uh, wow. We yeah. There's I, there were some trees that were in between you know 11, 12 where you couldn't see across over to the other side of the golf course that cuts across through the turnpike. Uh, and uh, we've cut all those down. We redid the bunkers. we uh, we took our east course, which is was a uh, a public course at the time. And then in 2007, we had the uh, men's open, and in 2010, we had the ladies open. And in between, it was tough to get it back open and up, so, you know, we cut nine holes and just let it for the kids and whoever wanted to go over there and play nine holes. And uh, now we're we're actually making that a parking lot uh, for infrastructure for the U.S. Open. $2.7 million project of, uh, of making this, you know, I'm in, Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania is a hilly place, and they are making this thing a field, uh, a parking lot, and they're making a five percent grade, and they're moving dirt, you know, nonstop. And uh, right. we got that project coming up, and uh, so that's the big one coming up for us, 2016. All right, but we'll be ready. We'll be ready. Oh, no doubt you will. I'm looking forward to it myself already, Eric. Remind our listeners how they can uh, follow you both online, your website, and over mm-hmm. social media. Yeah, you know, it's ericjohnsongolf.com, and uh, there's a lot of great articles. I've got uh, an article here in Golf Magazine this month on chipping. It's called the 12 Rule. Take it up, take a peek at it. Go buy Golf Magazine. Maybe they'll have me back. But uh, I can't (laughs) thank you enough for having me on the show. And just want to say, you know, a strong thank you to everyone out there. Keep bombing those bad guys out there. You know, anyone that threatens (laughs) the U.S. needs a bomb. But, uh, you know, we can't thank you guys. I know you're suffering a little bit out there, and, and uh, you know, we appreciate what everybody's doing. That's fantastic. Eric, thank you so much for coming back on the show today. You, you're always fantastic. You're a great guest, and I hope you'll continue to come back and be a part of the show because I really enjoy every time I get to uh, spend a few minutes with you. Hey, Chris, anytime. Thanks, for and congratulations on the success of your show. And I'll tell you what. You know more about me than I do. I don't know how you came up with some of this stuff. I, but I, you, you're, you're an in-depth guy. I really appreciate that. It was really great to talk to you again. All right. Take care, Eric. Thank you very much for that. I look forward to catching up with you real soon. And taking you up on, by the way, coming out to play uh, Oakmont and Pikewood, I think that would be a highlight not only of a day but of a lifetime. Oh, buddy, there's all kinds of tea times in January. We're waiting for you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's fantastic. There's Come on, I'm like kidding. You got a standing invite, buddy. Yeah, standing invite. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're wonderful, Eric. I can't thank you enough for that. All right. See you, Chris. See you, buddy. Take, take care, partner. Bye-bye. Bye. Eric Johnson, what a great guy. Tell you, I tell you what, they don't come better. He and Bob Friend, 
two great guys. I really enjoy talking to those guys, and I could spend hours going through all the stories. I can't thank him enough for being a part of the show. Well, we've got our next guest hanging on the line very patiently. want to get right to him. Uh, now making his third visit with me on the Kyvin Foods guest line is Callaway Golf Director of Marketing, Jason Finley. Jason, thank you uh, for getting up before the sun out there in California and also stepping away from the Ryder Cup to join me for a few minutes today. No problem. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me back on. So, Jason, you got you got five Callaway staff players out there in the Ryder Cup. You got Phil Mickelson, Jim Furyk, Patrick Reed, and on the opposite side, Henrik Stenson and Thomas Bjorn. So, I guess in this this instance, you're a little conflicted when you're watching Stenson and Bjorn out there. How are you dealing with watching <laughs> them in this event? Yeah, it's uh, you know we're rooting for our guys. Obviously, you know I prefer that. Uh, <laughs> Stenson and Bjorn go undefeated and the U.S. wins, but it's uh, it, it's still fun to watch and it's great to follow these guys. And, you know, all in all, it's been a pretty good Ryder Cup for Team Cowboy so far. Yeah, indeed it has. So how much fun, I was talking to, to Eric about this uh, before you came on the show, but how much fun is it watching the, the two rookies, Patrick Reed, your boy, and J- uh, Jordan Spieth, undefeated so far, knock on wood, the two rookies and, and, you know, one of your guys, you know, obviously one of your guys have been dynamite, and it's so so exciting uh, to watch these guys play together. How uh, how you, uh, I guess, what's your thought on, on Patrick Reed, who's had just an outstanding year so far? Yeah, no, he's been a, he's been a great addition to our team, and you know we signed him kind of in the middle of last year. He uh, he came over, and and he's really been a, a great success. And you know he's he's really a good dude, and he's as competitive as they come. So um, you know I think I saw earlier in the week, you know his his match play record in the NCAA championships, where his team won two national championships, was right. six and zero. Oh. So this is right in his wheelhouse, and you know this is this is right up his alley. Phil's record in the Ryder Cup hasn't been very good, but he seems to draw energy when he plays with the younger guys. Guys like Keegan Bradley, you know, who he's you know four and two with. You know, if you go back to, to 2012 and including you know one and one so far, you know, here in, in this Ryder Cup, also played well with Anthony Kim a few years ago. Talk, you know, talk about Phil and has he done, have you guys done anything different equipment wise for him in this event? No, you know, he's uh, he took a little bit of time, you know, off and. and spent some time practicing and uh he was obviously in our test center a few times and we had some guys out working with him on some golf ball stuff uh during that time but you know all in all he's he's pretty much dialed in with what he has been and he's he's ready for the uh year to be over and a fresh start though have you been surprised at all today that you know know, he and keegan aren't going back out and playing at all in the in today's matches yeah, I think uh, I was a little surprised. I knew he wouldn't play both both rounds, but I was a little surprised right. not to see him in this afternoon. And when I heard that, I was a little surprised. But, you know, he's kind of going with the guys that are hot and played well this morning. So, it's you know, it's easy to argue with, with the captain, but it is what it is. You talk about golf ball a minute ago. Jim Furyk is playing your speed regime three golf ball. He was a Strixon guy for years. What got him to make the switch over to Callaway? You know, he, uh, like a lot of guys, surprisingly, and this is a little-known fact, a lot of guys have come to our camp specifically for our golf ball. So, um, you know, he loves the the feel he gets with it and, you know, obviously the in-flight characteristics. He's a guy that actually probably shapes more shots than a lot of guys and, uh, you know, loves our golf ball, and that was one of the primary reasons he came. And in fact, when he first signed with us, it was only a uh, driver in, in golf ball deal. And he ended up, you know, playing all of our stuff and is, is converted now to a full staffer. But uh, it was just driver and ball were the primary reasons he came to our camp originally. You know, and Jim's had an outstanding year and, in my opinion, hasn't gotten enough credit for what he's been able to accomplish this year at 41 years old. He's he's a Pittsburgh guy and a Steelers fan, so he's you know, he's near and dear to my heart. Um, <laughs> what have been some of the other things that you guys have worked on with Jim? Did you talk about starting out driver, golf ball, and now full set? You know, What are some of the things you've worked on with him to enhance his game? You know, he's he's a guy that knows a lot about equipment. He, you know, you get these guys – it's a fine balance of guys that are really engaged and, you know, I don't, I don't know if tinker is the right word, but really in tune with what's in their bag and what the characteristics are and what it does. And he definitely fits into that camp. And, you know, so does Phil. Um, 
and, you know, is more likely to change than some other guys. I mean, Henrik Stenson's using stuff that he's been playing for a couple of years now. So, um, you know, it, it's just different, you know, different types of activities with them. But he, uh, Jim in particular, is very uh, knowledgeable about golf equipment and the specs and different weighting and, and things like that. So I remember at our ad shoot last year, he was asking a lot of questions you don't typically hear from guys, and, and was really intrigued by it. So he's a good one, and he's fun to work with. You know, Jason, you know, play, playing in the Ryder Cup, you know, has got to be a lot different than tournament golf and even major tournament golf. If you don't play well in a tournament, the only person that's, you know, truly hurt, I guess you disappoint, you know, your fans and, you know, uh, you, you know, for you guys, for, you know, your equipment manufacturer, but really you're hurting yourself. But in a Ryder Cup, you know, not only you, you, do you, you hurt yourself, but you, you're, you got you got the team, you know, the, the weight of the team on your shoulders that you could disappoint. Plus, you know, the, your whole country is watching in, and you got that on your shoulders as well. So there's a whole different kind of pressure in a Ryder Cup. Have any of the guys talked to you about the kind of pressure that they that they face and how they deal with it? Uh, not not a lot. We did uh, we had an ad shoot a few weeks back, and you know, we talked to Patrick a little bit about it. He was really excited for the whole. Uh, event and, and everything that went around it, and you know he's, you know, like I said earlier, he's he's competitive and he was ready for it, and, and certainly ready to have some some fun and and you know be ready to go out and win for for the U.S. and you know team golf to your point is very different um, than than what these guys do every single week, and and even you know you're not always playing and getting used to that, and and even you know alternate shot is is a very different format and. It's uh, you know I'm playing in a tournament this weekend and it's the same kind of thing. We've got partners and alternate shot and it's a whole different mindset going into it. You know, to your point, you know about the alternate shot. So these guys all have you know contracts with you know equipment manufacturers and you know is it you know you're playing your ball one time, which may be one manufacturer, and a different ball another time. How how hard is it to adjust to? You got to know the kind of ball your your partner's playing because if you hit it, it may hit differently, right? It may respond differently. Oh, totally. And um, there is definitely some some major differences in golf balls, and that's why these guys usually get paired together and play these practice rounds, you know, in the pods or however you want to describe it, in terms of you know what they're going to be playing, and, and that that's a big part of it. And it it does make a difference for these guys and. I think there is some consideration even for, you know, how that's all going to work when the pairings are made. Hmm. So you guys you guys have some new Big Bertha irons coming out shortly. You're, you're putting what's called 360 technology into those irons that you use in your fairway woods. The information says we could get two clubs longer, which got my attention. Explain what 360 <laughs> technology is and, and explain how can I get two extra clubs out of these irons. Yeah, so it's uh, it's a couple things really. The, the first you, you mentioned is the 360 face cup technology, which you know we've we brought out in fairway woods two years ago, and then in hybrids uh, this year, I guess. Um, and it's really a way to to make a face cup, we call it. And what that does is it it allows for higher ball speeds, and you know it's generated a lot of uh, momentum for us in the fairway and hybrid category. You know, in the U.S., we've had the number one fairway and hybrid just about all year. So um, that technology certainly has uh, taken on. And, you know, it's it's really a matter of as we're thinking about life cycles and, you know, what products we're going to bring to market, we said, well, what, what, how, what would happen if you put that in an iron? And there's there's obviously a whole different set of challenges with putting it in an iron, but we've been able to do it with the Big Bertha iron, with it, which has a kind of a hollow uh, back construction to it, which has allowed us to put that face cup in the iron throughout the set. And, and between that and some uh, configuration changes, um, you know, we've really made an iron that, that is longer. And where golfers are going to really see the difference in, in that the two clubs is in the longer end of the bag. You know, that's where you're going to generate incrementally more ball speed. We've changed the, the length configurations a little bit um, more to optimize ball flight. You know, there's a, you know, everybody thinks, oh, well, you just jacked the lofts on those you know, everything goes farther. But as you lower the center of gravity in an iron, you know, you get to a point where you could actually hit it too high and spin it too much to where it's actually going to go shorter. And that's a bad thing. So really it's about optimizing the loft length and the face technology in an iron to, to generate 
those massive distances. And what people are really going to see it is in the longer end of the bag where, you know, a lot of golfers tend to start hitting their clubs the same distance. All right. So, Jason, when I when I was you know preparing to have you on the show, part part of me wants to you know put myself in in your shoes and and wonder what it's like you know to be in your world. And one of the things you know about golf for for us weekend hackers is once we pull into the parking lot of a golf course, we get to put everything else in our lives sort of aside for the next you know four or five hours. You know, you mentioned to me that you know you got a golf event that you're going to play in later this morning, and I imagine because of your role at Callaway Golf, you got to be on all the time because not only you, you know you're out there representing a brand. So do do you yeah. yearn sometimes just to be able, be able to go out there with your buddies and just be Jason and not Jason, director of marketing for Callaway Golf? <laughs> yeah, you know it's uh, yeah you you always you know just enjoy getting away from everything just like you know the guys playing the Ryder Cup too that you know they all go out when they're at home with their buddies and play golf and have a good time and and that's that's something I still tremendously enjoy doing and but you know playing in competitions and you know this one that we have this uh this weekend in particular is always a fun one cuz it's it's called the industry cup so it's all the different companies uh playing against each other for bragging rights so it's you know this is kind of our version of the of the Ryder Cup and it's a ton right. of fun and and something you know we look forward to every year and uh, we're out in Palm Springs for it this year, so it's uh, it ought to be a good good time this weekend. And I, I like a mix of both. You know, I still like to go out and just have fun and be with my buddies and and all that too. But you know, it's certainly fun to get some competitiveness in every once in a while, and it's a it's a different you know mindset going into it for sure. All right, a couple more before we let you go, so you can go off and and, and have a good time. Two two of the big three are what you guys call Callaway icons. You've got Mr. Player and Mr. Palmer on on staff. What kind of input do those guys give to you for what you're what you're doing? Um, you know, they they don't provide, I would say, a whole lot of uh new product feedback uh anymore. But um they they still are, you know, greatly involved in everything we do and I would say that you know they're they're just as involved uh from a business perspective as they are on the the product perspective and you know certainly Mr. Palmer's not playing as much as he used to and and certainly not as competitively but Mr. Player is you know he's still in the best shape of of anyone you've ever seen and you know they they do a lot of corporate things for us um you know Mr. Player's been in talking to the company a few times even and you know it's as much a method message of health and wellness you know, as you see from him in general, as it is about golf equipment um, and the game of golf as well. But he's got more stories than just about anybody you'll ever hear from. And he's an amazing person to spend time with, that is for sure. I bet he is. Uh, Jason, you know, I'm a I'm a big fan of your Mac Daddy 2 wedge. I went out and bought that this summer, and it, it's it's made a big difference in my sand play. I'm also a big fan of your Super Soft Golf Ball, which is a – 38 compression golf ball, and I even feel it helps me with my driver. It keeps it very straight. And we, we just talked a moment ago about the new irons, but what are some of the new things that you guys have on the drawing board as you, uh, you know, look forward to the 2015 golf season? Yeah, we're, uh, we've got a lot of really exciting stuff coming, um, starting obviously with the Big Bertha iron, as you mentioned. We'll have another uh, driver uh, launch here. Um, before the end of the year and uh, more next year to come. So um, we also have a new and improved version of Super Soft, which is a little bit softer even. Uh, wow. So we're excited about that. And then, uh, frankly, we've we've learned a lot from that golf ball, and uh, we're really excited about it. And you'll, you'll see that um, spread a little deeper across our line, that sort of technology and um, performance idea. But you're right on the the super soft. That's been one of the things that, you know, a lot of people have kind of uh, reacted to is is not only how far they're hitting it, how great it feels, but how much straighter they're hitting it. And, you know, you can lower your spin on a, on a driver and it it helps a lot to hit some straighter shots and makes those long irons easier to get up in the air. And, you know, there's a lot of really good benefits to that golf ball. And we've sold a lot of them and, um, been frankly a little surprised with how well it's done and it's developed a little bit of a cult following. So it's been it's been fun to, to follow along to. 
Yeah, no, it's it's my go-to golf ball now. And boy, if you if you're making that thing even softer, I'm looking forward to you know testing those things out when when they come out. Jason, you know, thank you so much for continuing to be a part of the show and to come on and update us on all the things that are going on. I hope you'll continue to do so. We you know we really love when you're a part of the show, learn a lot, and uh, look forward to you know the technology. Boy, if I can get a, an extra two clubs. Out of those big Bertha irons, I look forward to you know taking a look at those things and you throwing that super soft golf ball. Boy, I could, I might actually be able to get my handicap uh, under twelve. So thank you for yeah, thank you for a, all the research on that. <laughs> yeah, no problem. And uh, thanks for having me on and your continued support. We really appreciate it. All right, Jason. Thank you for uh, for being here this morning. Good luck in the golf event there, and all our best to uh, to you and everyone at Callaway Golf. Thank you very much. Have a great day. You too, Jason. Thanks. Jason Finley, Director of Marketing from Callaway Golf. Great guy and uh, always has some great new in- in- innovations coming out. So, boy, I tell you what, I, I, I'm, I'm here to say it. It's not just because Jason was just on the show, but, uh, you know, those, those uh, super soft golf balls, are, uh, especially in yellow. I'm a yellow guy because I'm colorblind, so it helped me to find them a little easier when you're when you're out there on the, on the golf course. But uh, a great golf on that Mac Daddy wedge uh, from a sand wedge perspective has absolutely in, in, uh, improved my my sand play because that has been a uh, bugaboo for me, uh, you know, historically. And and my buddies would be the first to tell you that when they see me go in the sand, they think they got me. But uh, that has helped me get out and uh, and uh, improve my golf game immensely. So thanks to Jason for being a part of the show. All right, but before we put a bow on this one, I want to let you know about a great new book that's out there. You've heard me talk about it the last couple of weeks on the show. It's called A Golden 18, written by uh, Roger Schiffman, and the photography is done by one of our friends and one of the great uh, photographers anywhere on the planet, Jim Mandeville. Jim, I'm sure you know, is the director of photography at the Nicholas Companies. The book showcases some of Mr. Nicholas's greatest course designs. The stories about the courses are great, and the photography simply outstanding. In fact, it's so good, you're going to want to buy a second copy of the book just so you can take some of the pictures out and get those things framed. It's, it's really that breathtaking. To get your copy, go to nicholas.com and hover over products and partners on their homepage and then click on books and videos. If you love golf and you love stunning photography, you're going to want really want this book. It's fantastic. All right, everybody, it's time to put a bow on this episode. My sincere thanks once again to Eric Johnson and Jason Finley for being such great guests with me this morning. And I thank you for tuning in. I appreciate you the most. Please also check out our sister show, Thursday Night Tailgate, with me and my co-host Bob Lazare and our announcer, Joe Lajanusa. That show airs every Thursday from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time on Blog Talk Radio. It can be streamed or downloaded from great radio sites across the Internet. You can also find us Friday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time on, with our friends at Boost Radio. Uh, we're joined every week by legends from around the NFL and the CFL. We are official partners of the NFL Alumni Association, also the official radio show of uh, Mike Ditka and Jerry Kramer's uh, organization, the Gridiron Greats, a wonderful organization doing some great things from for the legends of the NFL, guys that you know were from way back when, from the 50s and 60s, before there was anything as uh, you know such a thing as a, a, a six or seven or eight figure salary. The guys who built the foundation that the NFL now gets to live on, unfortunately those those guys came along at a time when there were no health plans. So uh, those guys are dealing with all of the same sort of physical issues that today's players are dealing with, but unfortunately it's with no support. So uh, please check out that uh, wonderful organization to do what you can and to help you know, our, some of our idols and our icons of the sport. Again, it's Gridiron Greats. You can find them at gridirongreats.org. Also, please check out uh, our shows online. You can find this show at nextonthetea.net and ThursdayNightTailgate.com. You can stream or download any of our archive episodes and keep up to date with who our future guests are going to be. Uh, Thanks again for taking time out of your morning to listen to this show. Until next week, hit them straight, my friends. 